So I'm very pleased to uh, present today uh, this work. Uh, it's work that I have done with my group and several of my collaborators about who is afraid of IO. And I want to explore with you a couple of challenges and uh, opportunity for, for us computer scientists. As I said, this is work that has been be possible by several people who have been working with me, collaborators outside the university and my group at the University of Delaware, and of course several sponsors. So I want to start this talk by thanking uh, the several people. And as I move on in my talk, I will mention a couple of names uh, and cite a couple of papers. So let's start by looking at uh, how supercomputers are changing. And here, when we speak about supercomputers, we normally refer to uh, performance, performance of supercomputer. And we describe them through uh, a lot of metrics, but two in particular are quite important. One is the number of floating point operations that supercomputer can perform, called them flops. And the other one is the IO bandwidth, the speed that supercomputer have to write data to storage, to disk, not to memory, but to uh, non-volatile storage. And so I have here two pictures, and if I move my mouse, probably you can see so what I refer to. Um, so the first picture is about flops, and the second is about bandwidth, uh, or IO bandwidth. And it is the description of these two metrics for four supercomputers. Uh, Jaguar, which is past top 500 supercomputer, Titan, the present, and the future, Summit and Aurora. And if we just look at the flops, what we see here is that these machines are becoming more and more powerful in terms of computation. They are doing more and more computation per second then we need also to keep in mind the speed that this computer have to write data to disk because as they are computing more they are generating also more data and so here the figure in red is about the uh, io bandwidth the speed to write to disk and what we see here is that it has not changed since Titan, and we expect that also for Summit and Aurora, this speed will be constant. And it's not something that um, the developers have decided so easily. They have been so, sort of forced to keep this speed constant because of power constraints. Moving data uh, is expensive in terms of energy, and uh, keeping under control, keeping a cap on this speed, control the power consumption. So how does these characteristics, how do these characteristics change the um, life of scientists? Scientists who are using this machine for their simulations. Well, if we uh, look at how we use the machine today, how we run our simulation on Titan, or we used to run them on Jaguar, we had that we normally submit a huge amount of jobs and we save all the data, we analyze them later. So we go back after uh, the simulation has been completed, we move the data, uh, we normally use a centralized uh, server for the data, and we analyze them after the simulation took place. Well, if we are generating more and more data, and we cannot save them at the speed in which they are generated, we need to change the way in which we run our simulations. And we need to uh, analyze the data as we generate them. And perhaps we need to decide what we really need to say on disk. So we must change how we run our simulations. Now, when I go out and speak with colleagues in science and I say, you know, probably you have to change your way to run the simulations, I have this kind of reactions. First of all, I have people telling me, no way, the storage technology will save us. They will advance and they will take care of this problem eventually. If the colleague has expertise in science simulation and um, in uh, hardware, normally the colleague tell me, well, you know what, bars buffer, uh, which I will tell you more about, uh, will just solve the problem. And 
So it seems that in a certain sense, many of us are not really facing the challenge that we will soon have to address. Machines are changing, we have to change our simulations. And so if we rely only on the hardware technology and we say, okay, there are bars buffering, everybody speak about, we have heard about that, but in reality, very few machines are integrating bars buffer and very few scientists are able to use them. Can we just rely on hardware technology? Can you just rely on bars buffer and just go on and run our simulation as we used to do in the old fashion, save everything and analyze them? Well, let's try first of all to see if it is the case, if we can just relax and wait for the technology. So how does it look like a computer, a supercomputer? Well, we know that there are many, many nodes that we uh, dedicate for computation. Here you have only three of them. Um, and then we have dedicated node for the uh, I.O. to write and read from disk. And we have normally a large parallel file system uh, that we use for our storage. And so here you have a representation in which you have compute nodes that are currently suffering because the connection between the compute node and the parallel file system has been cut to uh, a specific low level of approximately one terabyte. So what happens if I run a simulation or I run multiple simulation, multiple what I call applications on my supercomputer? Well, you have something like this situation in which uh, this is the simulation that several applications are evolving, and I have that the applications are not coordinating to each other what is writing to the parallel file system when it is writing. And so they are competing to each other, creating congestion. And so what we see is a varsity IO pattern. Now, where is that the BARS buffer? Uh, can help. Well, we know that it will be, uh, it is in some of the machine, uh, for example, in uh, NERSC at uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and this is a picture that come indeed from one of their web page. We know that it will be something in between. It will be a very high speed storage that will be in between the parallel file system and the compute nodes. And will serve like indeed the name tell us it's a buffer we can easily very quickly write to the bars buffer and so eventually uh, the bars buffer will write to the file system so for the application and uh, for the several applications when they write uh, to the bars buffer they see a major increase in performance so they don't, they have a, the, the bars buffer is very close to the compute node and so writing to it become very quick. Then eventually the bars buffer need to write to the parallel file system. And if everything is uh, smooth and there is no major issues like the one that I will tell you very soon, what we have is that the data will be streamed to the parallel file system with some delay, uh, but in theory, we have solved the problem. Well, we have solved the problem if we have a single cluster connected to the parallel file system. And if the parallel file system is completely dedicated to the single cluster. Now, the problem we may have is that we may have multiple clusters. We actually have multiple clusters that are connected to the parallel file system. And the other aspect is that the applications uh, run and cumulatively uh, the average uh, bandwidth of the application may exceed the speed of the parallel file system in receiving the data. Now you can say, well, I can, uh, by a larger and more powerful parallel file system. Parallel file systems are very expensive. And if you have to explain to a national lab or a group that they are more expensive than compute nodes, normally they prefer to buy compute nodes. They are cheaper and they produce. 
parallel file system, well, they're useful, but they're more expensive. So there is a major investment into the compute node, and the parallel file system sometimes runs behind in terms of performance. They become older, and they are not replaced or extended so easily. So the key point is that eventually, we have just created a new bottleneck, which is no longer at the level of the compute node, but is at the level of the parallel file system. And that bottleneck is causing IO contention. So if they tell you that the bars buffer are the magic IO bullet, silver bullet, you can say probably perhaps, but you have to keep in mind that uh, there are several challenges. And there are two in particular that I want to address today with you in my talk and uh, discuss with you how these challenges can become opportunity for research. The first one is about the IO contention. I just told you, bars buffer don't have uh, a unlimited capability. Uh, eventually, uh, they run out of space. Uh, the parallel file system uh, may uh, become the major bottleneck because of the speed of the bandwidth that the parallel file system has. So that is the first challenge we need to keep in mind. The second challenge we need to keep in mind is that the bars buffer right now, when we discuss about bars buffers, we may normally refer to the fact that we are moving data from the compute node to the parallel file system, to the storage. But actually, uh, it's not just the issue of writing to storage. If we think about the complexity of scientific workflow, and I know that uh, you will have uh, another speaker, uh, Eva Dillman, speaking about the complexity of workflows. You will see, you probably have the opportunity to connect and think back to my talk when I tell you that workflow are very complex. Uh, scientific simulation are complex. And they don't require only to write to this. They also require to read back data, to analyze the data and visualize them. And so, Bars buffer right now don't address this problem. Again, another challenge we need to take into consideration. So let's start with the fourth challenge, the fact that we may have IO contention, that we very likely have IO contention in future exascale machine. And look at and a possible solution that my group, in collaboration with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, has been investigating. So it's true that we will experience IO uh, contention if we don't keep in mind what is the status of the system, what is the capability of the connection, what is the amount of data that are written by jobs during their execution. But if we learn and we take into consideration what is the IO needs of each job, and these become part of the scheduling, which is not the case now, then we can solve or we can mitigate the IO contention. So the idea is in scheduling policies that deal with large supercomputers, we don't look only at the computing power of the nodes, but we look also at the IO needs of the jobs. And if a node cannot guarantee um, the IO that is needed for the execution of a job, that job is not immediately executed. So we create what we say is an IO-aware scheduling policy. There is a paper of my group uh, in collaboration with Lawrence Livermore. It was presented in HPDC 2016. I don't want to go too much in detail in this paper, but I want to show you a couple of preliminary results, because this is a huge amount of work that is needed uh, to integrate IO awareness. But I want to show, as I said, a couple of preliminary results that I hope convince you there is a lot of opportunity for research in this field. And it is when we compare uh, IO aware, so this new policy we are proposing with the current scheduling policy that are what we call IO uh, ignorant. So let me tell you the experiment we have been running. 
So we took a system, we simulated a system uh, that is called CTS1. It's a cluster of almost 4,000 nodes that is a Lawrence Livermore. And it is a sort of prototype of what will be an exascale computer. And we created a condition in which uh, we uh, simulate bus buffers. And in a force test, we run uh, jobs by using traces of real jobs that has been executed at Lawrence Livermore. And we make sure that what the job requests in terms of IO is also available. So what we see here is that we create a condition of perfect provisioning. We also extend this test and we progressively reduce the capability of the parallel file system. So we make sure that uh, the amount of IO that is requested by the jobs is not always available. We say that we are under provisioning the parallel file system. And we uh, progressively reduce the capability of the parallel file system uh, and consider three scenarios of under provisioning. Then we look at the amount of computing time that is spent on the cluster to execute the jobs when we don't have any awareness of the I.O. requirement of the jobs and when we have this awareness. So uh, if you're looking at my slides right now, on your left, you have uh, the measurements of our simulation when we use current scheduling policy without I.O. awareness. And on your right, you have the results for our I.O. aware scheduler. So what you see here is two types of uh, measurements. We measure the amount of time for which the nodes are indeed used for computing, and it is the blue color in the bars, and the amount of time in which the nodes were allocated to a job, but because the job cannot write to disk because of the IO contentions, then the node is idle. It cannot compute any computation. And so what we see is that even if we have bars buffer, but we don't integrate IO awareness. As the, uh, we are creating this condition of under provisioning, as we increase the under provisioning, the amount of nodes that are idols become larger. Now, this is time that a scientist is paying for the computation. It's time that the scientist thinks is using but in reality it's not because the resources are uh, not are overwhelmed and dealing with IO contentions. As you see on the right, the fact that we introduce IO awareness eliminate that because now we schedule jobs only if you can guarantee the execution of the job with its IO request. So that was an example of how we can indeed tackle the problem of IO contention and create research opportunity and eventually more science. Now, the other challenge I mentioned at the beginning was related to the fact that at this point in time, when people speak about bars buffers, they always refer about a tool that allow to write to disk but doesn't support reading, efficiently reading. And that is an important aspect when we deal with analysis and visualization in complex uh, workflow. So I want to tell you about a second uh, research, uh, that second research topic that my group is uh, uh, addressing. And it is about integrating in situ and transit analysis simulations. And this is uh, a way to solve the challenge of uh, uh, dealing with complex workflows and uh, addressing the problem of reading from hard drives, from disk, which is currently not efficient. So uh, what we are proposing is to take the analysis close to the simulation. And it is definitely not our invention and our, our idea. It has been proposed since a while. 
we always speak about stopping moving data, but move the analysis close to the data when they are generated. And the in situ and in transit analysis is a technique that allows us to do that. Now, keep in mind that we are proposing to move uh, um, the, the analysis of data close to the generation of the data. And so we need to think about what kind of data are we analyzing? Because we cannot just have a solution for any type of data. And so what my group is tackling is the problem of analyzing uh, molecular structures and in particular protein trajectories. Um, so we sort of uh, zoom in into a specific type of data which are molecular structures. And we define in situ algorithms that allow us to analyze the generation of data as they uh, are indeed uh, created at the node level. So before to go in detail in our algorithm, let me just tell you a little bit more about what is in situ and in transit analysis for those of you that are new to this concept. Because I think that this is a concept that uh, more and more people are speaking and more and more it's gaining in relevance in our community. So the idea of in situ and in transit analysis is related to the fact that you're taking the analysis where the data are generated. And so if you are generating the data on a node and you want to perform in situ analysis, what you do is dedicate some of the resources of your node to analyze the data as they are generated. Now, the analysis can allow you to index the data, decide what to move to storage, or how to tune your simulation itself. Now, in this case, in, this, in my slides, I am using a couple of the cores of the node. But if you think about the structure of a node nowadays, you have uh, accelerators, you have uh, heterogeneous cores, uh, you can imagine that, for example, you could use uh, the uh, GPUs for uh, the compute intensive simulation, and then you can use the core of the nodes uh, for the analytics. When you speak uh, about in transit analysis, you don't look just inside the single node, but you move outside. And in that case, you have nodes that are dedicated for the analysis, but are very close to the simulation node so that you reduce the uh, network interconnection cost. Now, there are two aspects of in situ in transit analysis. One is the framework that enable this type of analysis. And there are several tools that are available. I have here two examples, data spaces and data stager, uh, but I'm sure that you may have heard from other type of tools. And so the tools to perform the analysis have to be general and work across platform. But the type of analysis and the algorithm that you develop to plug in in this tool is data specific. And the type of data we are tackling, as I said, are related to molecular uh, structure and structural biology. So let me give you a very short summary of what we are looking at and what do I mean for structural biology. I have simplified uh, the concept a lot, um, so I apologize if some people in the audience find that too simple. Uh, at the same time, I hope that some of you who are new to this concept can get the most from these slides. So we speak about proteins, molecules, and we know that they fold, they have structures. And normally we start with uh, uh, speaking about primary structure, which means the string of amino acids that we start with. And then we know that, uh, for example, if we look at protein folding, which is one of the possible applications we are targeting, we know that protein folds to form secondary structures, and we have two major structures, which is alpha helix, and you see that on top here in my slides, and beta sheets. Um, then we know that alpha helix and beta sheets come together to create tertiary structures. And uh, finally, we have that multiple protein interact with each other. We speak about quaternary structure. 
So keep in mind the idea of alpha helix as uh, beta sheets, because I will go back to this concept in my talk uh, again. Now, we are not studying uh, molecular structures experimentally in wet lab. We are using computers. So we use computer simulations and we study the physical movements of the atoms and the molecules to each other. So this is a picture that represents uh, a, a folding of a protein, which is again an example of molecular dynamic simulation we are interested in. So from the computer science point of view or computational science, Let's simplify that in terms of jobs and simulations. So a molecular dynamic job for us is a program that is in execution and generates sequence of frames, snapshots of what is going on inside my simulation. Whether my string of amino acids uh, take the shape of an alpha helix or a beta sheet. And so here you have an example of a very simplified example of molecular dynamic jobs in which I have three frames, three snapshots. Uh, this is another example. Now, a molecular dynamic job is only one job in many jobs in a molecular dynamic simulation. Because normally what scientists do is sort of of uh, starting hundreds of thousands of molecular dynamic jobs in which they uh, try empirically to understand the behavior of molecules. And so here you have a pictures of a possible uh, represent, simplified representation of a molecular dynamic um, simulation. So if we look at the jobs from a computer science point of view, a sort of naive computer science point of view. These are sort of black box for us. They run independently on uh, the many nodes of my computer. And uh, something that is often uh, said about molecular dynamic simulation, that they are embarrassingly parallel because you run these hundreds of thousands of jobs independently. The question is, as I am running my simulations uh, on my computer, on my large supercomputer, uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs on the order of thousands of nodes, how do I know what is inside the box? What is going on inside the box and analyze what is going on without opening the box? So here is a sort of... Uh, short representation of a trajectory in which I have a string of amino acids that uh, evolve. This, think about this as the content of my box. And as the time goes by, I, my simulation evolves. I uh, capture snapshots of my simulation, which are frames. And you see that the molecules is changing. And what I am often interested in is to understand when, for example, my molecule is now a secondary structure. And I want to do that on hundreds or thousand nodes, on hundreds or thousand jobs at the same time, without interrupting my simulations because I don't want to disrupt the simulation. I, the more, the faster I run my simulation, the better. But I also don't want to move these frames. I don't want to move them to a central node and then go back after one month to look at them because that would not allow me to change the simulation, to tune the simulation at runtime. And another thing is that, yes, uh, my node is getting a larger and larger memory, but I don't want to keep all my frame in memory and compare frame to each other, because there is clearly a reason of comparison to understand what is going on, whether there is a change in the configuration of my molecule. And last but not least, I don't want to move the frame across jobs or equivalent is across nodes. That would be a catastrophe in terms of communication. So that 
these are requirements that we want to attach to our analysis. We want to analyze every single frame as it is generated and get the most of that in terms of information, whether there has been a major structural change in the frame without comparison with the past, across nodes, or um, in uh, the simulation itself. So we need to uh, do some uh, simplification when we deal with molecules. And so we know that we have a sequence of frames. And if we look at the representation of the atoms in our uh, simulations, they can be quite complex. And we have a lot of uh, different type of atoms. Some of them may not be relevant to understand whether uh, the structure is indeed changing and how it is changing. So a first step uh, that we perform in our algorithm for the analysis is to simplify uh, each molecule we are simulating. And so we move from something that uh, look colorful and very interesting for a scientist to something very simple, which is what we call a backbone of uh, atoms. And that is because we know that every single amino acid that is part of my structure has one central atom, which is a carbon atom. And so we select only that carbon atom. And with uh, that, we build a sort of simplified backbone of my uh, molecular structure. And that is what I consider in my algorithm. Then, Let's assume I have a frame. It's a snapshot of my simulations, and I just generated it. And I want to understand what is going on inside uh, the structure, whether, for example, at time t, um, a uh, alpha helix, like, for example, this orange one, has been formed. And so I know the start and the stop of my uh, substructure. And what I do is I simplify it. I, uh, rather than using all the atomic information of my structure, I use only the uh, carbon atoms. With this information in mind, and by looking just at this frame at time t, I generate a very uh, simple matrix, which is the Euclidean distance matrix, by looking at the distance between uh, the uh, carbon atoms of my structure. So I'm looking at my structure at time t, I look at the carbon atoms, I look at the distances of each atom with the other, and I build this Euclidean distance matrix, which is relatively small. Structures are not huge. Uh, as I will show you, we are dealing with structures that can range between 10 and 20 uh, carbon atoms at this point. So what do we do with this distance matrix? We compute the largest eigenvalue. And that becomes for us a metadata, a value that I will use to tell me what is going on inside the box without opening the box. What does it mean? It means that uh, rather than uh, keeping in memory all the structures, I keep only the eigenvalue, and I rely at the, on the largest eigenvalue to know what is going on inside my box. So let's go back to the uh, sequence of frames I showed you before. So it was a sequence of frames that I was sampling from a simulation. So a frame at time 50, I imagine that is time, um, figurative time, and I generate from this frame the largest eigenvalue as I am generating the frame with my molecular dynamic jobs. Then I move on, next step, I have another frame that I sample, I generate again another eigenvalue, the largest again for this specific frame. I didn't look at the past and I didn't compare with any other structure. And I go on with every time I generate a new snapshot of my simulation, I also generate the largest eigenvalues. A very simple and inexpensive operation that I can perform in situ. And then I use these eigenvalues to understand what is going on inside my boxes and create 
And so I delegate to these eigenvalues. They become a proxy for the differences between the different frames. So there are several questions that you may have. First of all is whether uh, the distance between two configurations, the differences between two configurations can be indeed delegated to a single value. I'm making a reduction. I'm reducting, I'm re I make a reduction uh, of uh, a structure of a certain number of atoms into a single uh, number, which is the eigenvalue. Can I trust it? Can it really be a proxy for the distance between two configurations? And so uh, we have to go back and learn a little bit of uh, uh, linear algebra and uh, look at simple uh, rules that we have probably learned when we were um, in high school. Uh, we are dealing with Euclidean distance matrices that are symmetric. And that is a big uh, strength of our representation because uh, we know that eigenvalues of symmetric matrices are stable, which means that small perturbation of uh, uh, the Euclidean distance matrix is causing small changes in the eigenvalues and vice versa. So uh, also we know that uh, Euclidean distance matrices are insensitive to rigid transformation, so that is another plus. The other aspect that we need to keep in mind is uh, um, that we are uh, building a distance matrix from a three-dimensional body, which is the molecule. And so we know that uh, the number of eigenvalues we can get from this analysis is three plus two. In, in the general formula is n, which is n is the dimension of the space, plus two. So we have five eigenvalues, but we are dealing with we are considering only one eigenvalue, the largest one, because empirically we have seen that um, three of them are approximately equal to zero, and two are symmetrical. One is positive and the other is negative. So the uh, largest eigenvalue is the most representative information that we can get out. Now, so we accept that the eigenvalue is a proxy for conformational changes. Now let's make a step further and think about, but if I have an eigenvalue, does the eigenvalue tell me whether the structure is an alpha helix, a beta sheet, or is not one of the two? And to answer this question, we went back and looked at the PDB dataset, which is available. Uh, and we look at uh, uh, almost 3,200 different proteins and look inside the proteins and look at the helix and the strands. So we build a population of helix and a population of strands. And here you have the number of helix and their distribution in terms of the number of carbon atoms. I was telling you they're very uh, small, so go from 2 to 24, 25 in this case. Uh, and then we look also at the population of strands in the PDB data set. It goes from 2 to 16. And to see that we have quite a large number of uh, uh, examples. And for this uh, strand uh, helix, which are folded in the PDB data set. The PDB data set uh, represent the final configuration of these strands once the protein is folded. And so we look at this configuration and we compute the largest eigenvalue for them. And here it's uh, um, the representations of the eigenvalues for the uh, sheets or strands and the green one is for the helixes. And what you see is that there is a pattern, there is a clear pattern that tells us that given a certain number of carbon atoms, we can expect that if my structure is folded, then its eigenvalue, largest eigenvalues, is in a specific range of 
values. So this is very important because it's a sort of uh, uh, scoring function for our search. If indeed given a substructure, I monitor the eigenvalue of the structure as the simulation evolves, eventually if that substructure falls into, for example, an helix, I expect to have that the largest eigenvalue of that helix will have a specific range of values. It's very powerful and it is what we have been applying to empirical cases. So you probably recognize these figures. It is part of what I showed you before, it was the example of the trajectory. It is indeed an example of the trajectory. It is a trajectory, uh, a snapshot of a trajectory of the folding of uh, one of the three alpha helix of this uh, small protein. Um, and what you see is that I go through uh, several steps and eventually the third alpha helix of this protein folds. So it becomes a complete and stable alpha helix. So the question is, if I measure the eigenvalues of these frames, can I say when the uh, alpha helix is folded? And it is indeed the alpha helix without knowing a priori that. So we went back and uh, collected the uh, eigenvalues for each frame. So this is the simulation, oops, evolving. I didn't mean to go just there. Um, so this is my simulation. It is evolving. I have multiple frames and each frame I compute the largest eigenvalue uh, as I generate the frame. And I map them on, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, chart. Now I go back and I associate my observed largest eigenvalue to the PDB data set uh, modeling that I show you initially. Now, I also know that uh, uh, the helix that I am trying to uh, predict has 14 amino acids, so it has 14 uh, carbon atoms. So where I am interested to look at is indeed this column here. And what I want to look at is uh, uh, where these values are mapped here on this column. And what you see is that at the beginning, as I evolve with my simulation and the helix is not folded, my eigenvalues are approximately in this region. And then there is a point in which uh, there is the folding. The folding is taking uh, place and the string of amino acids become a helix. And after that, I have sort of stable uh, alpha uh, eigenvalue, which map back to uh, the range of values that I have found by looking at the large PDP data set. So if I didn't have uh, uh, any information, if I didn't know a priori that I was uh, indeed uh, observing a, the uh, creation of an alpha helix, I would have said that I have been moving here in this column and my uh, eigenvalue was becoming smaller and smaller to the point in which it was approximately here in this region, which is where um, I uh, expect to find a alpha helix in terms of largest eigenvalue, which is quite interesting because I can do that just by looking at the eigenvalues without again stopping my simulation. I want to show you a second case study, which is also very interesting. This is a case of a protein, it's a little bit more complex, in which uh, there is a specific uh, shape of the protein, and there is this alpha helix that suddenly become a, a beta sheet. And so uh, it comes, uh, you see that this is a frame approximately a, uh, 7,000 step and then I move on at 8,000 and 
I have my uh, configuration that has changed. And it's very important for scientists to understand when this critical change happens. Because, for example, what they do is they uh, mark that trajectory and they mark exactly which frames are uh, relevant for the change. Now, can we do that without stopping the simulation? As the simulation take place, can we at runtime identify that there is this transition with our method? That is the question we try to answer. And so again, we went back and we have the simulation uh, evolving. These are the frames that we sample and we compute for each frame independently the largest eigenvalue. And this is the mapping that we observed. So, we need to, to combine this mapping to uh, our observation with the PDB data set. Another information that we need to keep in mind is that the strand that is changing the configuration is uh, about 10 amino acids. And so it's important for us that we uh, sort of move along this line and we map back to the largest eigenvalue and we see that uh, uh, there is some sort of uh, um, constant largest eigenvalues. There are some fluctuations which are quite normal. Then there is a major transition and then there is a new uh, average eigenvalues. And if we go back, we see that indeed this was associated, this value was associated to a Elix, and this value with a larger range was associated to a uh, spread, a, a, a beta sheet. So again, we have been able, by looking at the values of uh, the largest eigenvalue, to index the trajectory and provide a clear information to the scientist where exactly this transition was happening at runtime. So I stop here uh, and I um, will be very pleased to answer your question. But before to uh, start discussing with you what I have proposed, let me summarize it. So first of all, we discuss about the fact that uh, we must change the way in which we run uh, simulations because the exascale machine are requesting that, are imposing that to the scientists. And if we think that just a hardware change or major hardware change like introducing bars buffer will be our magic IO silver bullet, we may be wrong. So uh, every time we have a challenge, we have an opportunity. And so I show you how uh, we, my group with my collaborators, and be able to take challenges like uh, IO congestion that we will observe with Mars Buffer and transform that into an opportunity to study IO awareness in uh, supercomputers. I also show you that um, there are aspects of uh, uh, workflow that will require that we start analyzing data as we generate them. And so I introduced the concept of in situ and in transit analysis for molecular dynamic simulation and show you how we can do that without moving data by taking the analysis close to the simulation in a couple of interesting examples. So I want to go back to one of the comments um, of uh, uh, some of my colleagues that said, well, you know, the storage technology will solve all our problems. And I do agree that new technology will help us to handle data at the extreme scale. But it doesn't come for free. We need to work uh, and develop new software paradigm, like, for example, um, IO awareness in scheduling, uh, in situ in transit, analytic algorithm for uh, data uh, that are generated. And as a matter of fact, I think that IO aware scheduling and in situ and in transit analysis are here to stay. And we need to um, make sure that uh, scientists can use them properly and benefit from them. So I stop here and I will be pleased to answer your questions.